You're listening to the Surgeons of Horror podcast. Hello, welcome to the Surgeons of Horror podcast. Its purpose is to dissect and discuss horror films both old and new. This current season we've been dedicating to the late, great Toby Hooper. We're four movies in now, and um, we've already discussed the, the the film that launched him, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. We've gone into Eaten Alive, his follow-up. Um, we did Salem's Lot, ah. which was the T. Te- <laughs> hey, we <laughs> we did uh, the TV uh, miniseries Salem's Lot and The Fun House. Now we come to the fifth film or the fifth discussions of our podcast, um, and it's it's the big one. You know, it's the one that. Um, there's a lot of contention around because of his partnership with Steven Spielberg and, of course, that poltergeist. Um, before we yeah. uh, before we get into it, I should introduce myself. My name is Saul Muerte. I'm the lead surgeon for the podcast. And uh, my co-host for today is the big cheese, Anthony Yee. G'day, how you I'm good, mate. I'm good. Thanks for coming I've got the ghost voice on. Sometimes I cut in, sometimes I cut out. In. Ghost voice! Out. Ghost voice! Um, this- I don't know why I always do these weird little songs when I'm doing a podcast with you. Anyway, yeah, it's all good. So, Poltergeist came out in 1982. Um, Great year for movies. Good year for movies, yeah. Bing, E.T. Kicking ass. E.T. is a good one to mention, by the way, in reference. Yeah, it is, because so. they're, they're uh, linked. Yeah, in a, in way. a big way. Mm. So, before we get into... Um, the actual discussions around Poltergeist and stuff. Let, let's, uh, quick question, do you remember the first time you watched it? I know. I, my first experience with this, again, this is a school film for me, so yep. it's enough to be intertwined with school experiences, that period in your life when you're a teenager and hormones are running and all yep. sorts of things going on. Eddie Murphy lied, the, the <laughs> Eddie Murphy lied in Furious when he talks about, uh, it's a standard routine, Eddie Murphy Kids is a SNL actor who became big in the 80s making films like Beverly Hills Cops and, so, and Beverly Hills Cop 2. What other films did he make? <laughs> Another 40, 48 hours. Another 48 and, uh, hours, For yes. smarts like people in Australia who didn't have the internet, didn't have SNL, couldn't access YouTube, watch SNL, didn't know who he was. He's this guy who comes out of nowhere, makes comedy action films, and he's a huge Hollywood star. Yep. And right. I didn't know that he had a whole... Saturday Night Live career going up before that. In fact, a lot of people do. They get on Saturday Night Live. Yes. They do a uh, couple of years. They try and make it big by having a standout character or standout comedy routine. Then they start talking movie deals and then they try and make it in Hollywood. Some fail, well, some don't. Eddie Murphy made it big. Uh, but he, in between all that, he put out a live album where it's a comedy routine. I forget the name of it, but he's wearing a Michael Jackson like jacket on the cover. Yeah. And he does a routine. The routine's famous for. To me, infamous for one reason. He talks about kidding women and yes. how you should your women if they back chat to you. Back in the 80s, fucking hilarious. Yeah. This day and age, the Me Too movement, not so much. The other one thing is he talks about, yeah, that's it. What's it, what's it called? Delirious. There you go. Delirious. And um, the other one he talks about was uh, Poltergeist. Yes. This routine was funny at the time where he's like a black family. If you like, it's the, the routine goes, this is a really lovely uh, house. There's a really lovely house, there's a beautiful house, and the TV goes, get out, what do you can't stay, mate? Like, said, a black family will not put up with that shit. <laughs> TV, black family's out. He's like, did you try to save your child? Yeah, we tried to change the channel, nothing happened, we looked out. <laughs> that was fucking hilarious. In fact, so I, I just established that the movie Poltergeist, which is too scary for 12-year-old me to watch, was about a television that sucks your kid into it, into the TV. Yeah. That was the first time. And then I saw the film years later on VHS, and that's exactly what happens. Um, and it's a great film. Yeah. No, it is. No, it is. I've got to admit, it's a very, very good film. And I will want to touch on that. I think that thought we'll touch on as we close out on the podcast. Yes, and I know. Paul, Paul's just, Saul's just looking at me going, dude, spoiler alert. <laughs> no, no, no. Spoiler it's not, it's not that. I just, I think there's, because there's so much to talk about the movie mm. that we need to get to that at the very end. Um, yeah. Because, uh, so what was your first memory? So look, the problem I have with Poltergeist is yeah. I merge it with Poltergeist 2, the other side. Yeah, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. There's, there's the thing about sequels and shit. Yeah, you can't do that. Because, because I, I keep having this image of Craig T. Nelson swallowing the liquor and having and the big maggot thing coming out of his mouth. Worm. Yeah. yeah, and I could have sworn that was in this first one. 
Um, no. Until I was no. w- watching it through and then went, well, when does that happen? And of course, I, I, I watched I watched the uh, sequels after after this, just in preparation for the podcast, and that's when I, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right, the whole really Indian get, burial really ground get, thing. And, the super yeah. shit, really super shit. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, but the first one was a work of art. But yeah, yeah, that was, so, that was, so, that was your first memory of it? So, so, so I had this kind of weird, because I remember the, the man, the old man in the second one was creepy yeah. as fuck. So I keep getting this kind of blurred thing going on with it. I, effect. I, yeah, 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 it is. Yeah, different um, universe. So, and so, um, I don't know, I don't remember when I first watched it, but that I, so I don't know, we even know if part of that. I don't know whether part of that warped memory is because maybe I watched the second one before I watched the first. Yeah, maybe. Um, and that was my introduction to the franchise. So, yeah. But like you know, it, it, it's so embedded in my mind that, that that the story of the first one as well. You know, the, yeah. particularly the the swimming pool scene at the end and um, oh, God, yeah. and things like that that come into it. That um, the batch and the tree. My memory was the tree being fucking. Yeah. Scary as shit, um, and things yeah, like that. Like so the it's, sequel, huh? that, that's it, the remake. And the, yes. the boy in the remake is a dead spit for my friend Stephanie Huber. If you're out there, Stephanie, I've told you this before. <laughs> it's pretty weird. He looks like her. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So it's a bit, it's a bit blurred, but yeah. So it's a bit, which is a bit interesting from my point of view. It's good watching it back, and it's, um, and maybe I will touch on the sequel as well, uh, the not the sequel. The remake very quickly yeah. towards the end as well. Um, only because I know that you and I went to see it together, um, yes. and it might even be just a passing comment on it, and um, and we'll close out. Yeah, shut up. Yeah. Sure. What? Yeah. What? Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and I, and I know I normally go through this uh, our discussions when we talk about these movies by going through the plot narrative, but this one deserves to be a bit ripped apart more than we do and eviscerated a bit more than we usually do, um, and that's because the key thing is that you um, you can't um, and I, I'm going to insert this a bit later uh, a sound effect after the fact, but you can't talk about this film without the elephant in the room. Because <laughs> yeah. the elephant in the room is Steven Spielberg. Yes. Right. You can't. No, no, you can't no, Jeff, oh, no, no, I thought you were talking about the actual elephant, Jeff. Yeah, Jeff. Oh, yeah. yeah Sorry, he, Jeff. He shat all over that set. Yeah, he did actually. He shat all over that set. Yeah. He did. And it was like, and it was like five weeks in before, like, could, do you think we could lose the elephant? Because he's not doing anything. Yeah, he's yeah. shitting everything. And I don't know, and apparently it's controversial as to whether Spielberg or Hooper said, uh, uh, yeah, maybe that's a good idea. And yeah. then they got rid of it. I think that was the big controversy. Yeah, I mean, it's I not his, you know, in, in Jeff's defence, it's not his fault, right? Well, no, he's an elephant. What the fuck else yeah. is he going to do about shit everywhere? Yeah, because he doesn't do anything. He's like, so, you know, he, he just kind of went, well, fuck you. Well, fuck you. Yeah. Don't tell me about the shit. Yeah. I'm an elephant, and also, I don't have a job. I'll shit where I like. Shit where I like, bro. Yeah. And stop feeding me food. That was another thing. Why would I keep yeah. feeding me food? Yeah, no exactly. Yeah. So, and yeah, so that, that was that. That, was that bit, that was weird. Yeah, that was odd. So, mm. so Steven Spielberg... Yes, that guy wrote and produced this film. At this point in time, he's trying to fucking ban Netflix films from being nominated as Oscar films, and boys are getting hauled over the calls for that. Do you know he's seventy-two years of age or seventy-one or something? Yeah, no, I didn't know that, but that sounds right. But he's getting the shit kicked down because he's like, no, Netflix films shouldn't be Oscar nominated films. Fuck you. Why? Yeah, it's a thing now. He's about to literally go to the board of directors and the Oscar nominated and pitch a case saying, for now on in, only cinematic films should be nominated for Oscars. And That's so many people are going, fuck you, you fucking asshole. Yeah. Yeah. He's, 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 well, if he does he's that, lost, he's really lost he's it. Lost, he's lost touch, man. Yeah. That's a shame, man. He's the greatest filmmaker of all time. <laughs> yeah. So are we, are we going to, are we going to defend Spielberg in this particular instance, though, or are we going to be like, well, I, 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 yeah, I don't know. I'm, this is, this is married at first sight for me. I had to get it. So I, I just, won fifty dollars by getting a reference to Meredith. You already, you it's already did that. You did that on one. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, well, there you go. Yeah. There you go. But no, because I wanted to. He said, he said, and I, I just want to state these circumstantial facts, and let's discuss what you, what you think is the real story. I have a theory of what I think the real story is, but we'll say that's the end. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's right. So look, either way, like uh, there's a controversy with Spielberg 
get Spielberg's involvement with this film. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Because yeah. because like his his actual involvement was that he was uh, he co-wrote this, and he was the producer. That's a fish, the official. By the official yeah. credit, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, and hence why yeah, the... a lot of film directors start off as writer directors, and then after one of the first couple of hits, they go, you know what, I'm gonna hire some other monkey to write this yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, okay, this is the this is the idea I've got. Um, um, dinosaurs with lamps, go and fucking make it happen. Yeah. And poor, some poor shit like that writes it, and he's like, thank you, that's what I want. Or he just ends up going, yeah, change it, change it, that's what I want, and he goes and directs it. But, yeah, because Spielberg was an avid writer, so was, so was Lucas, and I stopped doing that. Yeah. Very early on in their careers, and they just hired other people. Yeah, do. yeah. Anyway. When I said dinosaur with lamps, uh, I want dinosaurs with tramps. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so. Oh, oh, oh. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, that's like... Dinosaurs that, with metal clamps. Did I say that? that? That sounds like something I said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so... Uh, up to this point, uh, from as a, from a director's point of view, he obviously kicked off with Jewel. He did um, uh, two, a couple of other TV movies, Something Evil Sa- and Savage. He did Sugarland Express before then. He launched the, the summer. Yeah, it, that, before he did the uh, big summer blockbuster Jaws. Uh, we did Jewel as well, and, that was his, and he's like I he's a Jewel, TV yeah. director, which is what this Netflix backlash is all about. Yeah, yeah. Saying he got that on television, asshole. Yeah, and you don't want tele- and ne- you know you don't want television movies to be nominated. So, yeah, yeah that's crazy, a great area. Crazy what, houses. Um, yeah, before then, he would then do Close Encounters of the Third Kind, 1941. Imagine, I liked 1941. Yeah. What do you think of it? Ah, uh, it's all right. He hates it. Everybody hates it. <laughs> it's I all right. It's, it's okay. It's not yeah. brilliant. <laughs> We're at Hollywood. Uh, Hollywood. And then, uh, then he did Raiders of the Lost Ark. Never heard of it. Never heard of it. Um, before he then did E.T., Never heard of it. Never heard of it. The extraterrestrial. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's kind of where he's at today. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people, uh, particularly with the controversy about did Spielberg uh, lend a bit more weight to this film or not, people do focus on the Close Encounters of the Third Kind and E.T. the Extraterrestrial as case in point. Yes. Um, but we will get to that at the very end of our podcast discussion. Um, but what we do want to talk about is Toby Hooper. Because he is on the other side of this. Like, he is supposedly the director of the film. And something that is in this that is very Hooper is satire. Right. And really uh, satire about American values. Right. Which is embedded throughout this film. Um, And uh, you need to only look at, uh, like, you know, so, like, what I mean by that is... um, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre used um, gas shortages and job layoffs that was going on, on at the time. Uh, yeah. And he threw a satirical kind of look at that in a very horrific venture, obviously. Um, and then you you look at the sequel, which satirized yuppies uh, and small business owners. So it's kind of a very similar tone that's going on here with the look at suburban lifestyle and the American dream. Americana yeah. in the 80s, man. Americana in the 80s, yeah. And everything's about greed and, you know. And we've mentioned that before. That's come up um, in a lot of the, the Hooper stuff is the bastardization of the American dream. So it's a very common theme. And that's... So I guess my point is is that there is essence of Hooper through this film. And yeah. again, we'll reserve our judgment on what we think of that direction um, at the very end of the film. Um but uh, so let's um, uh, let's have a look at the um, let's take a look at the plot line um, and start the uh, plot line of the movie. Yeah, start kind of dissecting that bad beast. So um, okay, so go for it, buddy. Stephen and Diane Freeling live in a quiet life in Orange County, California. Wait a minute, a this sounds like a Wikipedia entry. <laughs> community called Cuesta Verde. Cuesta Verde. Okay. Alright, first thing, this is gonna take forever. Yeah. But this to me was a big snapshot in what American life was in the nineteen yeah. eighties. Yeah. Then I say this as a child living in Australia at the time, you're a child living in, in the UK. At the time. Yeah. But my best friend who you've met, Charlie Close. I have. Hi Chuck. Hey Chuck. Uh, was an was an American living with a large American family. And when I say large, they are all very big people. Yeah, they're but, very tall. Large family. They lived in Australia, but the thing that automatically got me uh, with his family and the way they lived their life in suburban America was like 
the, the, the close family, my friend Charlie and his family, the way they lived their life is very similar. They're just the energy of the house, yeah. the way they went up things, is very, very similar. A great example is in Australia, if you're, if you're living overseas and you, you live in Australia, don't leave food out. No. You leave food out, ants, cockroaches and spiders and shit will come and eat it. I'm yeah. having trouble communicating this to my wife and child, <laughs> her from England, they Child, my, my daughter, my stepdaughter leaves food all over the place. Doesn't get that. If you do that, after two days, cockroaches and shit come in because this is Australia. Yeah. We have insects. In this family, they have, because it opens up at night. It opens up at night. The father's watching television, falling asleep on TV as the television goes into the national anthem. Yeah. And it goes into the test pattern. Because even back in the 80s, television would stop and close down for a couple of hours in America. Yep. And then the camera walks around the house and then there's like kids who've got packets of chips in their bed never do that in Australia because yeah. you'll just invite hands and things but in America that's what they did it was like it's a, it's a it's a house full of toys it's a it's a beautiful two story house and it's yeah. just material stuff everywhere it's 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 America man materialism it, it, is yeah. key to this yeah it's very materialistic every, every kid's got well two of the kids live in the same room the oldest daughter who's 16 lives in her own room yeah. but this have a phone they have like in the yeah television it's just it's just not opulent but it's this is the standard of living for an everyday American family yeah it's quite it's quite fun um so it's an opening scene is this camera just follows the dog that's right yeah the dog the father, sleep, he's, he's lounging he's lounging by his lounge chair television goes to static dog gets up and wanders yeah. around the house um takes he snatches a piece yeah bag of chips off one of the daughter's yes. bedroom, one of the daughter's bedrooms, goes into another kid's bedroom. There's an infamous shot here as he goes from one bedroom to another. Do you know why? No. A crewman walks past shot. No. Oh. Um, he goes, you got to look closely because it, it is something that you do miss it because your brain is just wired to be, okay, we're going around the house. Yeah. But once you see it, you can't unsee it because it's dead smack center of frame. <laughs> but as it goes from one room to another, a crewman in jeans, and I think it's a green t-shirt, Right. runs from one part, end of the room to the other and goes right past camera through, <laughs> through a gap in the door. And it's a flash of G in the T-shirt. And you don't pick up on it until somebody points it out and you go, how did somebody not see that? <laughs> it's a really shot. It's a really bad thing. Um, but anyway, so that's the first shot. And then um, and then that's it. Is it the first? And then it goes to the next day and it's these, this big fat dude's on a bicycle with a slab of beer. And he's riding this, this, this bicycle to the Freeling's house because the Freeling are watching an uh, American football game. That's and right. the father, Stephen, uh-huh. has a bunch of mates over. Yep. And this guy comes with beer and they're drinking beer and they're watching the footy game and the television keeps switching because the television is central to all this. Yes. Because the next-door neighbour has the same television and his television is very close and the next-door neighbour's remote is so powerful. Yeah. It keeps changing his TV and vice versa um, and that, that's kind of a bit of com- there's a bit of comedy there as they turn for as the two neighbours can play and keep changing each other's channel yeah uh, yeah and so that's what happens and then um, what happens after that then well like the only thing I want to touch on um, yeah. just before you kind of uh, before we get into the other bit is just um, just to kind of discuss the middle class families thing um, because yeah. this is very much what we're looking at here, and some again, the, I, I'm deliberately kind of playing devil's advocate here because obviously with yeah. the whole directing um, of the movie kind of debate that's going on here. So that's why I mentioned uh, Close Encounters and ET because um, in both those films, it's a broken family household, absent yeah. fathers. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is a big thing with Spielberg. It's a very big thing with Spielberg, and in in this yeah. instance, it's a two point four family or two point five family household. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so it's um, it's a very kind of different dynamic. Dad, dad is very much on the scene. Um, and, and they're they ex- hippies as well, becoming yuppies. Like yeah, they're that's it. They're, so they're baby boomers. That's right, and, and even like, America. that's right, that's right. They're they're ex hippies. They had this. They had. There's a scene where they smoke pot too. Um, As a kid, I had no idea what the fuck they were doing. I, don't know why they were weird. I had no idea why they were acting weird. No, no, no. That's right. Yeah. No, me, yeah. me either. Me either. So, um, <laughs> yeah. the uh, a kid, a kid walks in on them, and I'm like, "Well, the person's are smoking." Back then, everybody smoked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why are they being so weird, man? Yeah, <laughs> didn't get that connection. No. 
Um, and the book, the book he's reading uh, yeah. was Reagan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Reagan. The Lord of Reagan for Reagan, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the book he was reading co- was called Reagan, the Man, the President. Um, yeah. So we'll touch on that book in a second, but the uh, the point was was the, with the middle middle class families. So there's a point of difference there um, between the two, you know, the two kind of directors um, and the smoke in the pot thing. So um, Hooper was very much about uh, the family dy- dynamic. You look at the uh, the Sawyers in the leather case, uh, leather case, <laughs> leather face uh, family. Uh, dynamic. It's a family unit that's, and it's a satirical look of American family, yeah. right? So there is this kind of strong influence there. Um, you look at the Fun House, um, and that's you know both sets of parents there, but they're also really dysfunctioned. And it, interestingly, the parents in that one are the ones that are transfixed with the TV as mm. well. They they just don't have this connection with the kids, and they're kind of hooked with the TV as well. So there are yeah. kind of themes that are kind of going along bubbling along yeah. here that lend weight to the fact that Hooper does have a bit of a voice in this and it may not entirely be Spielberg's 100% um, oh, was, it, was, that, was that formulated during the writing stage did he write the film or co-write the film no Sp- Spielberg did right okay oh, okay interesting okay. yeah yeah so there are there are things in there that make you go hmm um, but to go back to the Ronald Reagan thing, so obviously it's very much a, it's a it's set in the time of Reagan for a start. Yeah, but and the, he is like at the time when he was elected the most popular president. Yeah, ever. that's he right. Won Forty nine states out of fifty, like he crushed yeah. it. Yeah, and this is yeah. the point because this is a this is a, a look. We're looking straight away at the, how influential uh, this president was on the American psyche and pop culture as well. Um, yeah. That uh, and American Family Values was a really, really big thing, um, yeah, yeah. and he uh, was very kind of matter of Reagan. That was was very matter of fact in his delivery of um, his mandates and stuff. So they were very kind of simplistic, but to the point. Um, yeah. And I think that's what people kind of connected with in the states. Um, Sounds familiar. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, yeah. So. Uh, it just ties in with, it, particularly with the character of Stephen, uh, the dad, because he's very materialistic, and these are he, you could see somebody like his character being very easily swayed by Reagan, um, yeah. and and his thought process, especially like he's he's essentially he's a real estate agent. Um, yes, and he's a very good one. He's a very good salesman. Is the impression you get? Yeah, that's right. Um, so it is about materialism, and again, I'm going to touch on that, and I'll comment more on that at the end of the film. Um, but these are all kind of points that I wanted to raise about what's bubbling along beneath the surface during this film um, yeah. so when we look at the, uh, the the dynamic that's going on so there's a, there is a big kind of build up with uh, the family and the background and character development and stuff which is very Spielberg um, yeah it's done really well I yeah. think you have the, 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 the men downstairs having fun watching the football game you follow yeah. the mum and she notices that Canary's died the, the, the daughter's canary yeah. has died that's Twin. right so again this is, this is something you bring about whenever any ghosts or horror demons invade a house what's the first thing they do they kill the guardian the guardian's the pet usually it's a dog not a border canary <laughs> but, yeah, but what do you, okay canary. so Matt uh, so what just to inter- interrupt you sorry but what yeah. does a dead canary represent also, current coal miners, because they're very sensitive. It's a, it's a canary in the coal mine. So exactly. it's got all that symbolism going for it as well, because they're so sensitive to what's going on. Exactly. Which is bullshit, because I breed canaries, and I literally fart them. I crop dust them every morning when I wake up to feed them. I fart on them, because I want to see if one of them... Because I want to see if one's going to keel over. Not one of them has ever done it. Not one of them has ever done it, right? And I do that purely to see if it's going to happen. And they look at me as if they say, I will do that, but they don't die. So I think that's shit. So I think that's bullshit. Because I break in any specific with the purpose of fighting on them, see if that's true. <laughs> Never happened. I think that has literally become the best statement on Surgeons of Horror History. <laughs> that is. Anyway, back to Yes. So, um, um, yeah. So, Can- Canary's dead. So that's weird. Canary's dead. But I would, on that note, too, sorry, on a more of a serious note, this is uh, yeah. also an indication of that we are all mortal as people. And this, because mm. this is Carol Ann's first uh, experience of death, essentially. Yes, yes. Um, that she witnesses, and we have the whole kind of burial 
Well, because mum's, mum's about to flush it down the toilet. Cigar box. Yeah. She puts it in the cigar box, puts yeah. in food, liquid when it's hungry, and the photo of the family. And, yeah. Yeah. and then straight away, she says, buried, she goes, can I have a goldfish now? Yeah. Uh, so it's got a really nice sense of humour. Again, it's a materialistic thing too, but I think it's a... Yeah. To me, it's mostly what a kid does, like, you know? Yeah, yeah. Kid moves on. Um, and so that's the, the weird, that's the weirdest thing that happens. And then it goes into that, that night, doesn't it? Yeah. Right. And then... Is that when the, the, there's lightning coming and the father gives him the speech about lightning? You count, you count the numbers of beats between. Yeah, that's. I think that is it. Yeah, yeah. My father told me that when I was a boy. Yeah, same. He, yeah, your father like told me that when again, I was a boy. Really, really, this film tapped into so many things. <laughs> but it's, it's a rite of passage with men and children, particularly men. And, I don't know if it's men and girls too, but men. That's their job role as a father. Is he yeah. giving that speech yeah. to give him that? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's it. That's it. And uh, yeah, my dad used to do that. And then when he did, I said, "Oh wow, cool!" And it's about to get better because the kid has a clown in his bedroom, which he hates at yeah. night because it's spooky as shit. Yeah. So he throws a jacket over its face. I did that. Mm. I had a clown when I was a boy. Was given a clown doll. Hated it. <laughs> scared the shit out of me. Would throw it away or hide it or something in my bedroom because it wasn't my clown. It was a gift. Right. And I found it the scariest thing ever. And I did that too. So straight away, this film was just. Hitting all my buttons straight yeah, away. Yeah, as yeah. Yeah. That's right. Um, so, out yeah, of so interest, Dan, yeah, out of interest, did you have any poltergeist in your house? Uh, no. Okay. Really enough. Yeah. Oh. I mean, somebody was causing a mess around the house, particularly <laughs> in my bedroom, but I think that was me. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, there's another bit where the father goes past the teenage girl bedroom and yes. opens the door something, she's on the phone. Yeah. Again, I have a, she has her own dedicated phone line. Like, yeah. what the hell? Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah. Like, <laughs> That's, what house has that? <laughs> yeah. um, and, then, and that's it. And, then, and the, the boy counts the beats between the, lum, the lightning and the thunderbolt, and that's the it. lightning's getting further away. Yeah. It brings a relief. The girl has a the little girl has a goldfish now, so yep. they bought the goldfish that day, and they're going to bed. And then the father sleeps again in the, in the bedroom downstairs. Uh, so the lounge room downstairs falls asleep on the TV. It goes to static. Yep. Um, that was, that was the first night. The first night was... And then, anyway, she goes down. The she? first night, yeah, as well. The first night, that's when she... The, 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 the little girl goes down and starts talking to the TV and wakes up the family. Yeah. That okay. was all a bit no, freaky. No, saying, she's answering questions yeah. that, that, that you can't hear no, from some right. creature behind the TV. That's right. And the, the parents think... Yeah, the, and now we go to the next night and then the parents are smoking dope. And, and she thinks she's sleepwalking because apparently... The mother used to sleepwalk. Yeah. So that implies the mother has some sort of weird... Yeah. ...set weird to shit. Which um, is touched on in yeah. the sequel. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. But anyway, carry on. <laughs> um, and so... Uh, and again, there's a nice little moments where he's reading about Reagan, the rolling weed. He does a funny thing where he... He does a thing where he sticks out his gut and goes, before, after, before, after. <laughs> We've all been, the there. We've all nice. been there. We've all been there. They're good. They're in a good place. They're a good couple. They can laugh after three kids. It's really cool. Um, and then they fall asleep with both the little boy and little girl falling asleep in their bed. Yeah. Which is a very family thing to do. Yes. Um, and again, the television goes to static because they fall asleep with the static television on. Yeah. Again, like who does that? Like that's just you turn your TV off. <laughs> uh, but then the girl gets out and. She touches hands on the TV, and then these ghostly hands come out. Yeah, yeah. And I remember the sound of the music going. Wah, 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 wah. Yeah. That was that was the one thing I remember from the soundtrack. And these ghostly hands then become like a lightning bolt and fire from the TV into uh, the wall behind the bedroom, well behind the bed, and make, wakes up the entire family like it's an earthquake. Yeah, it's like this earthquake. I think it, I think it is an earthquake. Yeah. But then the girl turns around and says, "They're here." The infamous Which is the tagline of the film. Yeah. Uh, right up there with I'll be back and two still you have a problem. Yep. Uh, cuts to the next day. Um, we find out that the family is actually getting their backyard excavated to make a swimming pool. Yes. Um, and the backyard gets... The actual, when, in, during the excavation, they actually dig up the canary box <laughs> and throw it um, <laughs> That's a nice touch. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it is messed up. The, kid, the family having breakfast and yeah. the... Girl, uh, the teenage girl and the boy have a fight, and the boy's holding a glass of milk, and the milk shatters. Yes. Milk goes everywhere. That's weird. <laughs> um, 
he picks up his knife and fork at some point, and it's all bent out of shape, like Yuri Gagarin. That's Gagarin. right, yeah, yeah. Oh. I'll it's tell you my thing Yuri. about Yuri Geller. Yuri Geller, yeah, so Yuri Geller. Yuri Gagarin is a Soviet pilot, so <laughs> Soviet you know. I, I um, I went through a phase of Yuri Geller where whenever he was on a TV, I became violently sick. Yeah, right. It was, okay. it was weird. Yeah. It was a weird thing. Yeah. yeah, I just was like, like felt really queasy and sick. Oh, all right. Well, there you go. We mm. all sensitive. <laughs> and one of the construction work. That's right. And, then, and the girl, the teenage girl, the 16 year old, Dana, goes on a bike, and these construction workers start wolfing her. Yes. And it's like, which, again, this day and age, really fucking inappropriate. Yeah, but yeah. It's still, 16, really inappropriate. One of the guys wolfing her is Sonny in, in 48 Hours. Oh, really? Yeah, he's the, the bad guy. He, he, yeah, one of the bad guys up trees. Oh, uh, the other guy. okay, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's first speaking roles. And then she ends up flipping on the bird, which is very, uh, very, very adult back then in 1982. Yeah, yeah. And the mother looks at this, and the mother actually laughs. She, she does. It, she feels like her daughter can protect, like, can handle herself, and she takes... Yeah. Um, that she feels it's okay. Again, this day and age, the mother would be losing a shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. But um, one of the construction workers sticks his head to the window and eats the family's food. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> sticks his, sticks, he actually sticks a ladle into like some sauce she's cooking and uh, eats it and throws it back in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, she catches him in the act and goes, oh, you got good food, Mrs. Freeling. And she just she just closes the blinds on him. Again, doesn't lose a shit. She's no. like, whatever. <laughs> um, turns around, sees that all the kids have left all the tables She's cleaned the table at this point, but she's, the kids have all left on the table, the, the chairs out of the table. Yeah. So she goes around, puts all the chairs back under the table, then goes underneath the kitchen sink to get some cleaner. Comes back up all on shot, and all the table, all the chairs are now on top of the table. Yeah. Um, and that's, like, that's the first what the fuck Yeah, moment. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and where the she, the mother's seeing it. And of course, the, at this stage, Carol Ann keeps looking at television where, again, there's like three televisions in the house. It was back in the 80s. Yes. It's like, huge. Like, yeah. Who has three televisions in the house? But she keeps on turning to static and then literally sitting five, like two inches away from the TV screen. Yeah, yeah. Because she wants to TV people. And so the mother goes, wow, this is really freaky. And she looks at Carol Ann and goes, is that the TV people who did that with the chairs? And she goes, yes, they were. Yeah. Then it dissolves to Stephen working uh, showing a couple a house, which is an exact duplicate of his house. Yes. Because they're, they're, they're in a real estate community where the streets are, the streets are brand new, the houses are new, and it's only half developed, whilst the other half of the suburb is still being developed by other houses. And he's selling them. That's what he does, and he's very good at his job. Um, then he actually comes home. Yes. And, his mother, and the wife is very excited, and she wants to show him something. Yeah, yeah. And she puts a chair, she's cleared out, this is back in the kitchen, she's cleared out the kitchen table, all the chairs except for one, and she then she puts a chair, like, she does a, she's drawn a chalk outline, a circle. Yes, that's put right. Put the chair in the circle, and after a beat, the chair moves and slides across the kitchen floor to the other side of the kitchen. Yeah. And she thinks the most incredible thing ever, and she's jumping up and down, she's not scared, she's not terrified, she thinks it's really cool. Yeah. Um, and she gets, she actually ends up putting the daughter and then puts a football helmet on the daughter and puts the little girl on the on the same spot. She slides across as well. Yeah. And she's like going, "This is really amazing." He's freaking out. Um. And she's again, talking about she talks about being a free of mind back when we used to be young, as in when they were hippies. And yeah, yeah. This kind of thing and blah blah. blah. Uh, the, the little girl's bored of this, and mm. and the, fa- the father's freaked out. He's like, "Who else knows?" And she says. The other two kids don't know, just the little one and her. Yeah. And he's like, oh, well, we should stay out of the kitchen until we sort of figure this out. Um, and then it goes into that night. Is that right? Yeah, there, but there's a weird, there's a, I don't know about you, but there was, after that happened, there's a really weird cut in that bit. Like, after, yeah. from Steve's reaction, I don't know about you, because when I watched it, I didn't notice it when I first watched it, when I was watching it this time around. So the mm. cut was just really odd from Steve's reaction to then the next scene, I can't remember what the next scene was now, but I just felt like it was really quite a abrupt cut. Uh, was it, what, did, they go, did they go to the neighbour? Yeah, they go to the neighbour, yeah. yeah. And they ask if you see any weird, and they're getting, they're getting bitten by um, a lot of mosquitoes and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it was a weird, and I start it was, so go on. giggling hysterically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
But it was just a really, um, it was just, it felt like a really weird cut. That to me just okay. it jarred. It just and okay. it, it after, after threw me for the movie for a moment. Um, but yeah. Anyway. And then that night, that night, they, they, they're back. The family's in there. They're sleeping. And lightning. Yeah, get another storm. And the boy's gonna go to sleep. Sees the scary clown. Throws his jacket over the clown. Misses. Yeah. And thinks, ah, oh, fuck it. Um, I'm going back to bed anyway. Yeah. And then the lightning's coming. Thunder and lightning, and he's counting between one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, and the lightning's at the, the lightning and thunder are getting closer together, which means the storm is encroaching on top of them. That's it. Um, and then that night, basically, he has a scary looking tree outside his window, and that tree grabs him, doesn't it? Yeah, that's right. Comes in, through, and, breaks through and the pulls window. Out, which is so basically this tree's exploded through the window, pulls out the kid. Yeah. Uh, also, the whole family wakes up and just goes, what the fuck? Yeah, yep. Runs out and trying to save him. Yeah. Uh, which is a big distraction because what happening is that the spirits, bad spirits, are the poltergeist of the world once the little girl. Yeah. yeah. And essentially, the closet lights up and the closet opens up and bright light comes out of it. And they then Ooh. basically the no, family so rescue, the yeah, as a family rescue the boy out of the tree, they realize the little girl's not with them. And yeah. the mother, for example, realizes the hole they've dug in for the pool is filled up with water because it's been raining and yeah, stormy. Yeah. Um, and then um, the father dies in the pool, can't find her. No. So they all go, she must be somewhere in the house. And all four of them run into every room in the house trying to look for Carol Ann. Her yeah. name is Carol Ann. Going, Carol Ann. And then the boy is the one who finds her. He does. By running into the parents' bedroom yep. and screaming, I found Carol Ann, I found Carol Ann. And they all run in and say, where is she? And he points to the TV. Yep. She's in the TV. And they can hear, it's all static, but they can hear a voice That's going, right. hey, mommy. <laughs> and so they're like, what the fuck? <laughs> then it cuts to the father at a university, and he's talking to a group of parapsychologists. Yeah. Um, and it's been weeks. She, the, the, the daughter's disappeared. Yeah. They, the other kids are missed school. The eldest daughter usually sleeps at friends' place. Mm. Um, Robbie's missed school. And he looks like shit. Yeah, he yeah. High forms of shit. Uh, and he doesn't. He just wants his daughter back. And he's and they're like, going, okay, well, this is be weird. But they're very open minded, obviously. And they're made up of an older lady, a younger gent. He kind of looks like Steven Spielberg, and another guy who's the video tech guy. And they go and investigate the house. Yeah. Um. Uh, and basically, this is and I love I love this scene because they set up they set up in their lounge room basically. They set cameras all around the house, and uh, yes. they try and capture. And I love stuff like this. I really do. Like it's you and I have done amateur ghost busting. Yeah, yeah, I love the yeah. I really do. It's, uh, so, it's um, definitely where um, people like modern day audiences that will kind of get the reference with Insidious. Uh, yeah, from this, yeah. It borrows heavily uh, from. Yeah, yeah, the first. Uh, yeah, and yeah, the, and yeah. even the Conjuring when they first go around and they're investigating. The Conjuring the reminded me an awful lot of. I said yeah. it's poltergeist. It's yeah, yeah, of. yeah. Um, they have uh, a thing where um, the family all sleep downstairs in the living room. Yeah. They don't go into Cal. That's right. They don't go into Cal Ann's room. They show these psychologists Cal Ann's room, and they, that is one little thing where the guy said, "Yeah, I want you to take the car going from one end of the room to another." Oh yeah. It was an amazing thing. A toy car, a toy car. Yes. In a kid's bedroom, and it said it took eight hours. So what took eight hours? So the whole event took eight hours. Mm-hmm. Time lapse. You can't pick it. You don't want time. Mind's eye, but it was amazing. The guy goes, "Right, kid, that just remember that." And he opens the door, and the whole room is just yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. It's pretty funny. And another thing too, I want to say about uh, the house and the way it was decorated and the merchandise. It had it was it was uh, with ET and this film, but Star Wars is everywhere for kids. Like the Star yeah, Wars yeah, merchandise, yeah. Uh, the Star Wars bed covers. At one point during this particular scene, where stuff is flying around the room, a Tie Fighter flies past. Yes, and you hear the Tie Fighter sound effect. Yes, and the thing is. Spielberg and Lucas grew up together. Well, they didn't grow up together, but they were, they were mates through film school. Yeah. They were kindred spirits. And it's weird where you, as Spielberg, is effectively making a film about everyday life with, every, with, a, with, a, with a modern day family, and yeah. the merchandise of that fa- the house is filled with merchandise from another friend's film. Yes. And, and, you, and you get the sense that and you, and people probably don't realize just how much of an impact. These two guys in particular, yeah, yeah, Spielberg, yeah. had on the film yeah. and had on the world because of it. Yeah. Because uh, uh, Star Wars was just, I mean, there's no, there still hasn't been a film like Star Wars mm-hmm. in terms of what it done and the way it pervaded so many children's lives. It still yeah. does. Yeah, yeah. 
and Spielberg made the greatest films of the 80s, the greatest Hollywood films of the 80s for mine, anyway. Mm. Um, and this is him more on his way to doing that. Uh, well, we'll talk about that later. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so that night, as the parapsychologists are sleeping, once the two, they're, stay, they're staying up as much as they can. Yeah. One guy is literally monitoring the video equipment. The Spielberg lookalike says, I'm going to get something to eat. Yep. Oh, there's a lovely thing, too, where Family Guy sends us up. They whisper in a really weird way. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. <laughs> and they do it in such a way it's really kind of annoying yes and and, and family guys set this particular thing up the way they announce it and the way they talk <laughs> it's really grating the way they whisper um, <laughs> but this Spielberg guy or Spielberg lookalike goes I'm going to get something out yeah. of the fridge he literally goes into their kitchen goes over to their fridge and starts eating their food yes he, she eats a chicken wing pulls out a steak yeah I'm really sure they didn't bring steak so it's their steak sniffs it and goes I'll have that Puts the steak on the counter. Um, um, then here's uh, uh, the steak starting steak starting to move. So yeah, the steak yeah. into its way across the counter. Starts to sort of uh, eviscerate itself. The guy, he's got a chicken wing in his mouth because he's eating that chicken as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Chicken wing out of his mouth. It's got maggots in it. He runs into the bathroom, pukes his guts up. Yeah. Looks up and then the lights in the bathroom go red and suddenly he sees a little mark on his cheek and starts picking up the mark and yeah. starts basically tearing off his own skin and literally pulls off his own skin until bits of chunk of flesh are coming out of yeah. it. And then he suddenly screams and then snaps out and realizes, oh, it's a waking dream. Um, and then comes back into the room uh, and then the cameras all come to life. The cameras are mo- uh, red for red and designed to work. If something infrared walks past this lens, and one of them activates, points to the top of the stairs, yeah, and all these sort of ghostly spirits come running, sort of floating down the stairs, wakes up everybody, um, and then they sort of come down and they explode in this huge ball of light, which goes straight into the ceiling, and then all these bits of jewelry come out, yes, uh, watches and necklaces and That's right. earrings, and they look really old and dusty, yeah, and they're like, well, what the fuck is going on? Um, and that's like a huge moment. They play back the videotape and they realise that the, the bits of light look like lost souls. Yes. Um, and they're wandering around for some reason. Um, so just uh, yeah. just to put a pause on there for a second. So like yeah. the, the the bit with the steak and the bit with the the man pulling his face apart. Yeah. Uh, are quite a lean more towards the horror element, right? And um, yeah. And then that has also been those people that are more on the Hooper fence. Um, do kind of say that leans more towards his styles of, mm. of directing rather than Spielberg. Um, I, my, my only thing with the whole face thing is like Spielberg did do that with Raiders of the Lost Ark with the melty face did. thing, right? And it like, feels like Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah. It really feels like it. And what's more, those were, Spielberg, those were Spielberg's hands. Yeah. Before you right. the mm. So straight away you're like, yeah. Yeah, I know, yeah, man. Yeah, so, I, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll say my opinion of what I think about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, keep it, on tracking. It did feel like a Spielberg way of doing. Yeah. If, I, if he read yeah. the script, that would be how he'd do it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, uh, so yeah, so they come back the next day. Basically, the the next day, the woman, the, the parapsychologist, Doctor Lesh. Lesh, yeah, tells the mum she's coming back. The other guy is coming back, but the Spielberg clone is not coming back because he's had the living shit scared out of him. <laughs> Yeah. And she's going to get those um, bits of jewellery appraised, but she says, I'm coming back with help. Yeah. Um, and she does. She comes back with the help of form of a tiny woman who's a psychic. Yeah. Called Tangina. Uh, Tangina, yes. And she does this really wonderful thing where she wanders around the house. She straight away just gets drawn to the upstairs bedroom, runs upstairs, and she yells out, Who, you know, uh, who's, how, whose room is this? And... Uh, the father, Stephen, tries to answer her psychically yeah. by not speaking. And, uh, and, and and the woman comes out and says, if anybody's interested, I was addressing the living. And then so Stephen sees that as proof that she's a fraud, she's not really a psychic, because she couldn't read his mind. Yeah. Which I, it doesn't really kind of work like that. Those psychics, particularly these days, say it doesn't really quite work yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then the woman proves that she did by saying, I heard you, I just wanted to speak out loud. Mm. And then essentially, yeah, you find out this house has many hearts, whatever the fuck that means. Yeah. Um, and, and so the young the woman the woman tells the mother, who's 
They're saying that the, the daughter's alive in this house, but she's in another world. Again, Stranger Things. Yeah, she's yeah. in a parallel dimension, effectively. Exactly. Um, there's basically a lot of lost souls here, um, and they're clinging on to it. She's somehow punched away into that universe. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and those lost souls are having, holding on to her for dear life because she has life, and that's something they want dearly, yeah. so they won't let her go. I love that bit. I so love that whole concept of them. Um, oh, it's really great. And the way yeah. she does it, because the woman's crying, she, she's pleading. The mother is pleading. She'll do anything. This yeah. woman says, you're going to have to do something, do stuff that will violate your, your faith as a Christian and anything else. Yeah, yeah. But you have to do anything I say to the letter. Will you do that? And she's like, yes. And so she's at a wit's end. Um, yeah, and it's the whole love of what you do to, 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 to get your daughter back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a great, uh, it's a good, uh, this is probably one of my favourite little moments is this this little interaction. Yeah. yeah. And also, to, to me, I must have, the one thing that the sequel did, the, yep. not to, the remake, the remake did, remake. was show you exactly what that meant. Because I, as a yeah. kid, I got confused as to what it meant. What it was, Carol Ann lives in that house, but in the parallel version of that house. Yes. Yeah. And the sequel, the remake, sorry, showed that. Yes, they very, did. Very, very yeah, well. yeah, 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 they did. Um, and then Stranger Things as well. Stranger Things is doing that. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the upside down physically looks like our world. It just it's really fucked up. Yeah. And dark and stuff is shit, like bleaking and, and horrific and stuff like that. Yeah. So that's where Carol Ann's effectively gone. Um, at this point, Stephen's boss has come in and, and sort of said why. Well, kind of come in and checked on him because Stephen's taking a lot of time off work. <laughs> The boss thinks Stephen's looking for another job. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And, and the boss sort of takes him out and says, look, we, we haven't treated you right. We should have made you a partner. So how about how about this? When you come back, you get a promotion and you get a much bigger house. Yeah. And he shows him another part of the estate, which yeah. is called Phase 3 or Phase 4, I don't know, and said, you can have a house here that overlooks the entire valley. Yeah. And then he goes, well, here's not really good. And then he cuts to a white shot and you realise there's a shit ton of tombstones everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Can't build here, and he's like, "Oh no, we've done it before." Yeah. And he's like, "Oh, we did it where you where you guys live." He's yeah. like, "What? This, uh, we, this is news to him." Yeah. But the guy he implied, like, "Oh, it's fine. It's all above board. It's okay. We can just relocate the cemetery. It's all yeah, fine." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spoiler alert: Not really. <laughs> not really. Um, no. So at this point, we cast the family. They're getting ready, and again, I was confused as to what this is about. But basically, <laughs> they're getting ready to get Carol Ann. So they're going to go through the. Bedroom door, a cow, the best closet door in a bedroom that yeah. Carol Ann got sucked into. Yeah. They're going to tie a rope around the little short psychic who's going to find Carol Ann and pull her out through the other dimensional portal, which is the ceiling of the living room. The living room, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and they test it by throwing two tennis balls through mm. this portal and it comes out the other end and it works. Mm. Then they throw a rope through there and that comes out and it works. And then uh, the woman starts freaking out. She starts. She realizes there's another presence in there. Yeah, that's really, really powerful and very, very mad and yeah. powerful demon. She might have mentioned this before, but mm. there was another presence, there. and that was the one that punched the hole between yeah. the two universes and grabbed that's right. Carol Ann. So she implies that he keeps Carol Ann close to her. That's right. So that the spirit of the human un- spirits at unrest, at unrest stay close to him because he wants to keep them there because that's, right. that's what's stopping those spirits from moving on. Yeah, to go to light uh, through the light. So. Uh, that demon sort of possesses that young woman, the, 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 the psychic. Yeah. So she kind of, and so they decide that the mother's going to go in and grab Carol Ann. I don't think this is quite exactly how the events go, but this is the upshot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Woman, you, you, you're getting to it because like, like, Steve, so, Steve wants to tie the rope around her waist, and she's yeah. going to go after Carol Ann. Steve wants to go. The dad wants to go, yeah. but the mum says no. You're, you're, we need someone strong enough to hold the rope on the other side. Yeah. He, yeah, he's got to do it. And there's a lovely moment where they kiss and the yeah. lights back around and, and then the Dr. Lish sees this because they're, they're family and they love each other the whole yeah. wing to sacrifice each other and she's like, don't let go, he's like, I'll never let go. Yeah, yeah it was quite powerful. Yeah, it was. And yeah. she does, she, she runs through but you don't see what happens which is, I've got this theory too by the way, Ghostbusters, this is your film. Yeah. The moment in Ghostbusters where they all line up to the big building and the whole people cheering Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters, yeah. Ghostbusters because they're going to deal with whatever the hell's been happening in the building and this big rift opens up underneath and they fall through a hole through the earth. That's right. And the fa- and people think they've died and yeah. then they see them climb out one by one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, th- I thought the sequel should have been what happened to them when they fall through the hole. Oh, okay. Because they, they, I, I was like, they've been pulled to another dimension. Yeah, right. Which is what they do in the remake with uh, Kristen Wiig and, and Melissa McCarthy. Yeah. They, and you follow them as they get pulled into the other dimension. And I wanted that movie as they got pulled in because 
Kristen Wiig gets pulled into this other hell dimension through the, through, through the, through the floor, through a hole on earth, like a hell hole. Yeah. Melissa McCarthy goes after her, grabs her. I wanted them to look to the side and see Bill Murray, <laughs> like, in their parallel dimension, cross each other. That would have been awesome. Really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would have been cool. That would have been a nice moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but you never see it, and again, they showed it in, in the remake, which, is that good or worse? I don't know. But in this film, you don't see it. You just see her get pulled out the other end. And her hair's gone, got a massive grey streak. Yeah, in. yeah, the Bride of it's Frankenstein look. Lovely touch, because she's been terrified. Yeah, yeah. And, and they take Carol Ann to the, like, to the bathroom, because she's not breathing, and they, they, they put her in water. Yeah. And she's got this jello shit all over, which is ectoplasm. I know. And, and she wakes up. This scene is, it's basically a rebirth scene, yeah? It's a what? It's a rebirth, rebirth yeah, because it's in water. She's in water. She's in rebirth. water and like she's made in glue mother's, from... mother's breast. Yeah. And she's like, hi, mommy, hi, daddy. Yeah. And everybody's going, oh, my God, it's great. It's all great. And the, the psychic woman says, this house is clean. And it's all, yay. They've been to the ringer. They win. Yeah. And Let's... that's the end of the film. Yay. No. If it was a Spielberg yeah. film, that would have been the end of the film, yeah? Yeah, well, I, uh, yeah, curious. I'm very curious because yeah. <laughs> this is the era that film started to have a coda. Yeah. And I think the most famous example of this decade was Aliens. Yeah. They go to the ringer, they get, like, they leave the planet, it blows up, and they leave just in time, they land in the hangar deck, and then uh, Bishop gets a big fucking huge spike sent through his chest because yeah. the, the Queen Mother. Yeah. So that, that, like, that's Dakota, it makes you go, oh, fuck, not again. Yeah. Um, and I think this film did it too. Like, yeah, it's over, but <laughs> they're like, okay, you know what? The house is clean, that's fine. The Stephen has decided to quit. Uh, he's going to tell. He tells the mother, "Look, put the kids to bed, but I'll come back later tonight and we'll go to a hotel. Yeah. But let them sleep because they're young kids and they need to get to sleep." Yeah. And and the woman says, "The wife says, what if what if you tell? What if you refuses to accept your resignation?'" And he's like, "I'll tell them to go to hell." And she says, "What if he still accepts? Doesn't accept your resignation? Because I'll give him directions. So he's, <laughs> he's over. He's going to move on." Yeah. Um, they sleep in the fucking house. <laughs> they spend even a couple of hours in the fucking house. <laughs> don't do that. I don't give a shit if it's clean. <laughs> what the fuck does that mean? Like in fucking pol- uh, in in in, in um, paranormal activity, right? Yeah. Let's write this little let's write this little clause. Oh, wherever you go, the spirit will follow you, so you might as well stay in the house. That's no, no. <laughs> I don't care if that's what's going to happen. I'm going to stay at my friend Paul's house, <laughs> and whatever fucking horror follows me is going to wake him up too, okay? So we can both make shit together. Yeah, that's yeah. Fucking, you don't stay in the house. I don't care if you come back at 10 o'clock and pick the family. You don't stay in the house. <laughs> they stay in the house. They sleep in the same bedroom. Like, just sleep on sleeping bags on the floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's the right. Yeah, there's, there's, the there's, there's a lot of uh, dislogic going on. It's meant to be all kind of very... They uh, think it's over. Yeah. It, uh, what? What? And and the mother at this stage is dying her hair because she doesn't, you know, because she's gone grey. And then suddenly, sure enough, it comes back again. Yeah. This creature comes back. Uh, and it does this thing where it grabs the mother and pulls her up and throws her around the room. Basically, it's the classic, um, the room that's on a, on a big turntable and she, she rolls it. Up one wall, across yeah. the ceiling, and down the other wall. That's right, yeah. Um, make him laugh, make him laugh. It's that effect. Yeah, yeah. Um, or, or yeah. Lionel Richie's yeah. walking on, uh, dancing on the ceiling. Because yeah, Lionel Richie does dance on the ceiling. You know, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> he drops up in this movie, dancing on the ceiling. It's very odd. Um, yeah, it is, it is. It's, a, it's an 80s film. Also, yeah, it is, it is. Um, and then the mother runs towards the kids. Because the kids, the same thing, the closet starts lining up again. Carol Ann just says to herself, not again. Which yeah. is quite well said. Yeah, I like, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's right, because that's, oh, that's right, it, it kicked off because the boy, yeah, he threw the jacket on the, on the clown, it yeah. fell off. Yeah. And and then he wakes up in the middle of the night and the clown's gone. Yeah. That's and the fine. clown basically grabs him from underneath the bed yeah. and that's like fucking horrific. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, it's really just terrifying. And the clown's face has changed too. It's yeah. more demonic. demonic as it grabs this kid. And the kid tears it apart and just says, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's the sign that that shit's going to kick off. Yeah. And the closet door lights up, pulls in Carol Ann. Um, and then the mother runs towards the kids, screaming, don't you hurt my babies. And the, the classic vertigo shot. 
the trauma burning the, the lens. Yeah, makes them, yeah. The heat run towards the colder it makes it look longer than it actually is. It's really good because it's all the stuff of nightmares. It's supposed yeah, to yeah. nightmare feel stuck in molasses you can't move. It's a really cool effect. Um, yep. Yeah, and, so, and she, and kicks the, well she kicks out the door, and the kids are, are both being sucked into this vortex coming out of this yeah. room. Uh, and she she grabs onto the Robbie, the the boy, and he grabs onto Carol Ann. They both pull her back, and she sees the demon at this point, doesn't she? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's and, and it's terrifying. It's just, she she grabs the two kids. Everything starts crashing around the house she tries to get out the door mm. and this huge coffin comes up yeah. in the middle of the floor opens up and this body falls out straight out of there's a lost ark <laughs> and she screams <laughs> and then uh, yeah and then he comes home this husband comes at this point Stephen and the whole place is just um, explode that's right yeah, uh, the mother nice. at one point falls into a pool she falls into the pool and all the dead bodies yeah, come, floating bodies come up. Yeah. and the neighbours the one that saves him pulls her out that's right and she pleads for the neighbour to help him, but he won't. He's just no, terrible. He's, he's like, just standing there, stupefied. Well, he won't move. Yeah. So she runs in, grabs the kids. Yeah. Uh, eventually, uh, Stephen does he turns get up. to them. Yeah. Um, gets in a car. Um, uh, Diana, the, the teenage daughter, comes up. Yeah. Screams. What? She gets dropped off by friends. And yeah. She screams. What's happening? They all jump in the car. Um, uh, the, yeah, the, the something comes bursting through the garage door and lands on the, on the front of the car. I think is that right? Yeah, I think so. You got the uh, you got the uh, the boss turns up as well. Yeah, the boss turns up, and then Stephen realizes what's happened, and he, yeah. he pulls him aside and screams at him. Yeah, you moved the headstones, but you didn't move the bodies. Yeah, so, and that's what's kicked the whole thing off is that they effectively desecrated yeah. the cemetery. Yeah, um, and so that's what the spirits are at, not at rest is running through the yeah, house, yeah. and then he takes off the car and drives off, and the whole family looks like. They're being through a war zone. Mm-hmm. Um, the family check into the hotel they were going to check into. Yep. The whole time, they go inside a room. The door slams shut. The door opens up. The television gets kicked out of the door. Yeah. The door slams shut again. And the camera cranes up yeah. and roll credits and this sort of nursery rhyme type song, which is kind of creepy, but yeah, kind yeah, of cool. comes in. So yeah, thank. Yeah, that was a uh, good kind of speed through the narrative there. And and I realised you were the one like leading the charge of that, but I appreciate that. Um, That's cool. So the, um, the 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 thing I just wanted to pick up on the end of that though was with the TV being kicked out of the room. Is that TV is such an important uh, object that's used in this movie, um, and how its impact on society has come into play, uh, and effectively it's used as the portal of evil, and it says a lot about uh, consumerism and and the way American life is has gone, and and the we as a society, and we're obviously gone leaps beyond that now, but we as a society have become, well, had in the 80s, become addicted to this new thing that you could pretty yeah. much have in three ba- three rooms of your house if you were wealthy enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, it, and it was, um, it was uh, consuming and taking over the souls of the American public. Um, so there's a big kind of comment around that being used. And it's interesting that the last act... Um, is the dad kicking the TV out of the room. Um, and also, uh, on the subject of values and materialism and, and wealth, is also uh, a sign of what is evil. And the house has to be literally destroyed with all their possessions yeah. in it for them to be en- to end up with nothing, essentially. like they All they have is each other, which is the core family unit, which at the beginning of the unit, movie was fractured and all over the yeah. place and by the end of it they're together and they're a solid unit but they can only be that yeah. by getting rid of all their wealthy possessions and all, all their values and stuff so it's, it is a very politically kind of a, a, a political commentary movie um, yeah. and again that's very in keeping with Hooper just looking yeah. at our journey through it okay um, so I just found that was quite an interesting uh, little action in the end there and, and the fact that everything goes crazy at the end as well um was was pretty interesting. Um, so, um, so end of the day, let's let's get let's answer the question. Yeah, who directed this film? Steven Spielberg. Wait, let's answer time. <laughs> well, cut that again. Steven Spielberg. Yeah, that, that's awesome. I agree, hundred percent. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, 
it is his shot. Like it's his lenses. It's his camera movements. It's, yeah, there's so it, much it, in there. It, that's... It's his direction. His fingerprints are all yeah. over. The look of the film, the feel of the film. He's actual. He, he does a lot of one shot, one shot takes at the hip. Yeah. Like the camera at the hip level, one shot take. That's that's his signature move. Yeah. Things pop up in the frame. Change, you rack focus as one thing pops up and the foreground goes, the background buys. But that's 100% him. It's none of Toby, Toby's uh, style of directing no, at all. No, no. It's his film. He completely, the, he completely directed the film. The controversy behind it all, obviously, uh, being um, he wasn't credited to do it. If he had been found that he had, there's all, there's all sorts of problems that came from that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Sent out, he sent out a, uh, a, a publication, because back then, no internet. You can't make a Twitter statement. So he took out a page in, on the, in the Hollywood Reporter or somewhere and made a basic statement saying, uh, effectively sort of saying, you directed this is your film without actually saying it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He played it in a certain way. Uh, but basically, he's, he's officially come out and said, no, 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 it's his film, he directed it. The, the actress who played the psychic came out afterwards and said, Spielberg directed it because Hooper was coked off his nut the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> so you got all that going on. Um, um, it, it, all I know is I've looked at it. I assume, I assume for years Steven Spielberg directed that film. Yeah. The yeah. only odd thing about it as it's in his canon is that it's a horror film, which he doesn't really do, even though he's done films with horrific elements. But yeah. I just thought, okay, maybe he just wanted to do a horror film. And he did it. No, maybe not. He's done a science fiction film. Mm. He's done an adventure film, that. so it didn't bother. But when I found out it was Toby Hooper, I'm like, no. And I assumed that oh, it's Toby Hooper. Yeah, yeah. Then that's when I heard about the controversy. And I said, no. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's so him. It's so him. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what, what, what's your information on, on all that? What do you, what have you heard? Look, look well, nothing, nothing. It's from my point of view. I well, from what I've been reading about it, nothing had been has been officially declared. You know that on record, it is still Toby Hooper's film. Um, uh, the camera assistant guy was one of the ones I think you just said that as well but was one of the guys that came out and said uh, no Spielberg when we were on set Spielberg was one calling the shots um, so I have I have this view that um, because the fun house kind of happened before this right um, and it was actually the fun house and all its credit is actually a, a bit of a forgotten gem I think it's a good good little movie and I mentioned that in the last podcast um, but it was elevated him enough to kind of get him into a bit more high, high profile. And I think somebody like Spielberg would have probably initially gone, you know, I've got this idea for a movie. Um, I feel like um, it, it's a horror film. I've not really done horror. Here's this guy who's done Texas Chainsaw Massacre and the Fun House and has proved that he can kind of, you know, hold his own behind the lens. Like, if so, if I kind of commission him to come in and, and make this film. Um, then he he's got the right kind of ideas and elements that come into play to kind of do what what I want to do that maybe I can't do uh, or haven't gone there yet. You know, with a hor- in the, the realms of horror. But I think what may have happened is like maybe one or two days on set, in because Spielberg it would have been his baby. Like he wrote it and he was producing it. He would have been around on set. And I think and look, I could be putting two and two together and making eight right. But yeah. my, my instinct is that Spielberg is very meticulous and and then the way films are to be shot, like he's got he has his screenshots down to He's a big storyboarder. Yeah, big storyboarder. Exactly, yeah. right. And so and and Hooper's very much as a fly by the seat seat uh, um fly by the seat of your pants <laughs> gorilla style yeah. uh, approach to his movies. That's how he is. He's very and I and I think that's what he does well. He does dirty, gritty films really well. Um, and we get a bit of a crossover of style and approach to the movie happening with these two uh, directors coming into effect. And I reckon Spielberg would have taken one look at his approach. And maybe, I don't know, but if he was, um, if Hooper was coked up to the eyeballs, Spielberg may have come in in the first couple of days and gone, shit, we're in trouble unless I, yeah. I do something. And he may have yeah. just gone, I'm going to take over. Um, and done it, and so uh, and so that's what I mean. But I feel like there are essence of Hooper in this. So I think Spielberg yeah. may have done uh, Hooper the courtesy of at least lending a little bit of his voice to it throughout them. And he may and Spielberg may have taken on some of his advice on on stuff, but very much so it was 
like everything about it the look, like you said the look the style the tone of the film is Spielberg um, yeah. you know so and I think that's what happened I think Spielberg just went yeah I, I've got too much money banking on this I'm not going to let this go down the toilet yeah uh, and like uh, two movies before like uh, yeah two movies before so Eaten Alive was uh, was being made uh, Hooper actually walked off that at the end of the film and didn't actually complete it because he had a uh, uh, conflict with the with the producer so he didn't actually complete that the producer did um, so there's a bit of a similarity kind of going on there um, and then even the the fun uh, the fun house or there was another one in the mix as well where he goes off uh, to go and make a film in the in Britain called The Dark, and has an altercation with the producers again, and ends up walking out and never actually actually makes that movie. He he en- returns to the states to complete the movie he was working on, which I think I feel like was The Fun House, but I could be wrong. Uh, my point is, it's up to that point there was a lot of um, unreliability going on. Yeah, yeah. with Hooper. Um, and it seems like a lot of friction between him and producers. So if you read between the lines and say that that was his behaviour at the time and somebody like Spielberg, again, coming in and seeing that kind of behaviour would go, yeah, I've got I've got too much resting on this. I'm not going to... Yeah. You know? I could be completely wrong, though. Like, so I, I'm not... I don't want people kind of thinking I'm saying that as gospel. That's just my interpretation of what may have, may have unfolded. Um, so that's exactly, that's, that's exactly what happened. What do you think? That's what I reckon happened. Yeah, I honestly think that's what happened. And it's that's inter- it. yeah, huh? I'm saying that's exactly what happened. No other interpretation. <laughs> so, um, so uh, when you look at the uh, the next film off the ranks is from Hoover's perspective too, and we'll talk about that in the next podcast. Um, we get Life Force come out. Yeah, which, which is and a, it feels like a very different film. Yeah, it's a sci-fi film as well. Um, yeah. And there are elements in that that feel like he has been influenced a little bit by Spielberg in his direction, yeah, right. which doesn't happen up until that point, you know. And I, and I think I feel like there's stuff, and even that movie, like he admitted, was bigger than Ben Hur. He did not his yeah, quote. Yeah. I'm using he that. Should have handled it, yeah. Um, and said that he'd never shot a film with that size and that kind of budget. Um, so there's like there's lots of things in play, and I don't want to speak ill of the dead uh, yeah. with Hooper because I feel like he is an integral uh, uh, director within the horror film circuit. Like they, he played an, an incredibly important part, uh, particularly with Texas, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But was that like in a bottle bo- moment? I don't know. Um, well, yeah. See, my thing too is also uh, I've, I've dealt with producers or executive directors or parody mm. directors. Who come on and do that? They take over the set because they have yeah. a, they can't let go. They have a particular vision, and they can't be hands off. And, and I can imagine Spielberg, he is he does he's been a writer, he's a producer, he's been an executive producer, he's been a movie mogul, and a company director. Yeah. But he's put on this earth to do one thing above all else, and that's direct. Yeah, I can't imagine him at that stage of his life. Letting go that easy. Yeah, exactly. If you've seen him doing it now as a seventy year old man, yeah, and he has. He's made produced some wonderful films directed by other directors and they've been great. But um, I could have I don't know, yeah, just this is theory based on no speculation other than theory. I could have seen him because I think the energy on what I what has been quoted is that the energy on set that Toby Hooper's not a take charge kind of guy. Because as an independent filmmaking, you probably work at a different pace and a different rhythm. At least yeah. he did. And Spielberg's sitting going, This is a multi-million dollar industry we're a part of it's a Hollywood machine yeah that's right somebody has to say hey guys this is what we're doing so um, yeah so look that, that's where we stand on it and so I, I feel like it's an interesting it's an interesting turn and obviously it was a contentious moment for um, for the film as well so my, my point is is that it's it, yeah, it didn't, definitely doesn't feel like and it's been one of those kind of talked about um, things as well with the, within the film industry like, it's a very kind of con to, uh, what am I trying to say? It's a very uh, taboo subject, talk about subject um, mm. that's been um, that's been addressed. The um, the only last thing I just kind of wanted to touch on was obviously the franchise. It did spawn two other films. You had the Poltergeist Two, the other side, and Poltergeist Three, the one that had 
um, Dallas from Alien in it. Uh, uh, Tom Skerritt. Tom Skerritt, yeah. Uh, both movies were pretty woeful. Um, yeah. And um, and then obviously the remake the, of the you know, of the Poltergeist film, which we um, which we both went to see and said, yeah, pretty much it was shit. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting, isn't it? It was, and and you can see when people try and emulate that the story, it's never really worked. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, yeah, because it is a lightning in a bottle type film. It's yeah. very tough to remake and make better. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's like trying to remake Alien or trying to remake Star Wars, almost. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's right. Um, that's right. Yeah. The other elephant in the room we should probably address before we go are yeah. two names. Dominic Dunn yeah. and Heather O'Rourke. Yeah, yeah, that, that was going to be the last little bit, and it's probably a nice little fitting thing to end on because of the Poltergeist curse. Yes, um, the Poltergeist curse. Yeah. So uh, those that aren't familiar with that is that um, the uh, lady Dominic Dunn, who played the older no, Dana, Dana um, so this guy. was her this was her first film as well, and yeah. she. Uh, so it was released in 1982, as I said, and she actually died on November the 4th, 1982. She was only 22 years old, um, and she was strangled by her former boyfriend. Um, yes. And, yeah, and was killed. Um, yeah. Which was, you know, such a, a massive tragic um, end oh, to, yeah. to um, so potentially would have been quite a big uh, career that she had in front of her. Um, yeah. And then um, Heather O'Rourke, who played famously played Carol Ann in all three of the Poltergeist films. She also came to a very tragic end. She died in uh, 1988. She was only 12 years old and she died, died because of an acute bowel obstruction. Um, yeah. So, which led to this whole kind of thing that there's a curse around... Uh, a curse. Yeah. I don't know if that's true or not. I just think it's... Well, Craig T. Nelson had a good career. And so did Jabez Williams, who played the mother. Yeah. Jo- so... Was was she a bit of a um, was she a bit of a milf? Uh, she was she was that sort of. No, I I realised that, but like I don't know because I I didn't get I was too young to kind of get to get that you know but but since then there's there is a thing about. I know we've been a long time. We know that I'm a decade old before. Yeah, she she yeah she was that older. I don't know, yeah, because it yeah, our age bracket, she was starting to become the uh, handsome woman age. Yeah, yeah. And did some really cool films. She did, play, she did this really cool film um, where she played a detective in a series of novels. Oh, yeah. That she, she used to love to read. I was called Switch. Um, and she gets amnesia and she thinks she's this, this detective. In, she's traveling to Paris as an American, reads these detective novels, gets amnesia. Yeah. Thinks she is this detective and gets involved into a real life detective case. And, uh, as a kid, I thought it was kind of a cool TV film, actually. Yeah. I'm trying to remember what it was called now. No, um, I don't know. I don't know, yeah. man. I don't know. I just thought I'd throw it out there because you're a little bit older than I am, sir. And yeah. um, I was just wondering your take on it. And obviously, Craig T. It's Nelson cool playing the, uh, the dad, and to me, he's coach. He was coach. He's coach, um, he's coach yeah. He's totally coach. Um, uh, and he's boy. really good in this, too. And the boy was, was cool. In it, uh, believable performances, and like the uh, and that again lends itself to Spielberg was very good with kid actors and and all that stuff. Um, and the last thing I probably will say is also is how shit was the actual medium? Cleanse yeah. the house, my foot. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's <laughs> like, and she comes back. They get her, they employ her back for the second one. They're like, didn't you learn? She's yeah. not good at this. <laughs> didn't do a great job. Didn't do a great job. But I mean, overall, we, yeah, look, we can talk about it. Overall, still, it's lightning in the bottle. It is a great film. Yeah. If you've not seen it, um, yeah. definitely see it. I think it's it captures a time period in, in American history that's uh, just encapsulated inside a really wonderfully yeah. entertaining story, uh, movie. Yeah. Like, it's, it's a horror movie. It's a family drama movie. The yeah. characters you root for. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just you get caught up in it. It's an adventure film too. It's really cool. Yeah, yeah. So it stands up today. Yeah, very much so. It's, yeah. it's I mean, I'm, I've got coloured glasses because it's. Hmm. I had that sort of television set. I had that sort of TV remote. Yeah. Um, I lived in that sort of house. Or I lived with people that came from that sort of house. Um, I had the style, same style as bed sheets. It's all. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
the effects, even though they're obviously uh, old school effects, yeah. it still holds up as a as a story. You can get. Yeah, yeah I agree. I agree. Yeah, I do. I agree one hundred percent. I think it's a it's uh it's still relevant. Um, the eighties part that's obviously embedded throughout it does kind of make it nostalgic and retro as well. So when people do watch it, it has that feeling. With it, particularly with uh, the wake of you know uh, Stranger Things that's come about, which obviously played yes. a master that, that you referenced earlier. Um, there's lots well, of Stranger Things. That, it's it nominated it as a big influence, but this film's a big influence. Yeah, in yeah, by far, by far. This yeah. definitely with the yeah a lot of uh, stuff that comes into effect with it. Um, yeah, so like for me, it's definitely it's a seminal film. It's uh, and it does definitely stand stands it stands strong today. I think it's a very very cool cool film. Debatable on the whole to Toby Hooper directing front, though, as we said. Yeah, um, yeah. But despite that, we will continue our Toby the Hooper. Uh, Toby the Hooper? No, we won't. Toby the, <laughs> Toby the Hooper. We will continue our Toby Hooper film discussions in the podcast uh, as we roll out these. But until then, I am your host, Saul Muerte, and I was joined by Anthony Big Cheese Yee. See you, mate. Goodbye. You're listening. To the Surgeons of Horror Podcast. Music supplied by Peter Nezik. For more discussions or podcasts, head over to surgeonsofhorror.com or head over to our Facebook and Twitter sites for the latest news and updates.